Welcome to this special edition of the Who, What, Why podcast. As part of Who, What, Why's series marking the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John Kennedy, we present two interviews with two people who share their firsthand knowledge of a central character in this story, their acquaintance and friendship with Lee Harvey Oswald. Their perspectives on Oswald are very different. One knew him in Texas after Oswald returned from a two and a half year stay in the Soviet Union with his Russian wife, Marina. And the other was among Oswald's best friends in Minsk during his period in the Soviet Union. And he was present when he first met Marina at an evening lecture and dance in Minsk's most prestigious venue. And so we present these two conversations, first with Paul Gregory and then with Ernst Titovitz. Professor Paul Gregory is a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and has been a pioneer in the study of Soviet and Russian economics. In addition to his scholarly work, he has been an active blogger on Russian affairs for Forbes, The Hill, and The Wall Street Journal. He first met Lee Oswald in Texas in 1962 when Oswald approached his father, Peter Gregory, who was Russian-born, to seek a letter of recommendation for himself as a Russian language translator. Professor Gregory tells his story and much more in his book, The Oswalds, An Untold Account of Marina and Lee. And it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Gregory here to this special Who, What, Why podcast. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Well, it is good to have you here. It is interesting in the title of the book, you, you talk about an untold account of Marina and Lee Oswald. It's interesting putting Marina first. In many ways, she is so central to this story. Talk about that, that decision to put her first in the title and whether you think that's significant of anything. I thought long and hard about this. Um, Marina covers a broader range because she, of course, survived uh, her husband. And a great deal of the story that I have to tell is uh, what happened after the assassination. So I'd say that's one factor. The other factor is that in terms of friendship, I regarded Marina as a friend. With Lee, it was much more difficult to say, was he a friend or, or what, what, how, what, what noun would you use to describe him? It's, it's somewhat difficult. So uh, I, that's not a very uh, complete answer to your question, but uh, that's what comes to mind first. Talk about your friendship with her and how it was different than, than how you knew Lee. Well, the uh, formal reason for the relationship was that uh, I was to go over to their duplex on Mercedes Street uh, two, three times a week and uh, talk Russian uh, with Marina. Uh, she was a rare, uh, uh, a rare thing uh, as a as someone who had left the Soviet Union recently. Uh, most of the Russian speakers with whom I and my father uh, were known uh, were displaced persons, or like my father and George Bucha from Dallas, uh, they were from the uh, Civil War period. So she was uh, a real opportunity to speak uh, Russian and to learn about what uh, Russia of the Cold War was like. So that was the relationship with her. Uh, the relationship with Lee is that Lee happened to be there. Uh, Lee happened to participate in a lot of our discussions and things we did uh, around Fort Worth. But the main reason for for my spending time with Lee and Marina was uh, the language and learning about Russia. Talk about the language aspect of it. And, and you wanted to talk Russian, and, and you talk about this idea that she had just, just come back. Was, was there any change with respect to language? Was she a, a more modern version of a language? Talk about that. Well, one has to have a very sophisticated knowledge of the language uh, to answer that question, um, probably the, and so I couldn't judge, uh, although she did consider my father's Russian, which dates back to the 1920s, was uh, somewhat archaic. So at least she could see that there was a difference between 
her language and the language of the Civil War uh, refugees, um, such as my father. Probably of greater interest was Lee's language, because when we were uh, together, we spoke only Russian. So I'm one of the best judges of Lee's uh, Russian, uh, which is a subject of some speculation, because some theories uh, say that uh, Lee was sent to some KGB training camp where he was taught Russian and taught espionage techniques, etc. So there, there is interest in uh, how well Lee spoke Russian, and I'm a good judge of that. Uh, the bottom line is he could express himself well in Russian, but uh, his grammar was uh, horrific. So he, he, he was able to to speak at the factory where he worked among his friends, where he worked in Minsk. Uh, but he did so without really uh, understanding the grammar, which is rather complicated in the case of Russia. His writing, of which I had uh, a, a few examples, was equally bad. It was not well known that uh, Lee was dyslexic and had a great deal of trouble writing and spelling. What about Marina? What about her writing in, in Russian, her language skills, her grammar? Talk about that. I mean, was she that much more educated that, than he was? Uh, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, she, uh, Marina, was a trained pharmacist, which is less rigorous than the training our pharmacists go through in the United States, but it was definitely above the education level that Lee had. Lee uh, always chafed uh, at the fact that uh, he had to work at um, blue collar jobs. And he was irritated that he always earned $1.25 an hour. So um, there was this difference in education. It was not something that Marina played up. I mean, she I never heard her holding it over Lee's head that she was more educated than he. Uh, but I imagine this was something that was unspoken between the two. What was your sense of, of the nature of their relationship, the good and the bad? I would say that there, there were... No sign, no signs of affection between the two, which doesn't tell you that this was not uh, a, a marriage of love. Uh, I would say the most striking fact is the fact that once they moved to Dallas and fell under the wing of the Dallas Russian community, she had uh, a number of opportunities to leave him uh, to live uh, with uh, Russian speakers uh, with whom she shared a lot. Uh, um, and she never took advantage of this opportunity. She would leave him periodically, but she would always take him back. So although there were no signs of affection, um, there were signs of abuse, which I saw, because at least on one occasion, I went to their house and noticed that Marina had a blue eye and uh, she could see that I was about to ask her about it and she basically signaled to me, no, leave it alone. There was incident of in, there was an incident of, of uh, verbal spousal abuse, which I witnessed, uh, which occurred when Marina uh, fell backwards off their porch and hit her, hit her head uh, dropping baby June, and this this caused Lee to um, break out in in just a, a flurry of uh, abuse, uh, verbal abuse. Why are you so stupid? Why could you do that? All the while, I was uh, worrying that she had uh, had um, a, a brain concussion. So that was the one sort of striking incident that I saw of what one could call spousal abuse. 
What is your sense as to why she didn't leave? She had friends in, in the Russian community there in Dallas, Fort Worth. Why didn't she leave? That's a, a, a very good question. Um, I don't have an answer to it. Uh, the he, he did have sort of a Svengali uh, approach to her. Uh, he kept her isolated. He kept her from learning English whenever I would ask her whether she wanted me to help her with her English, which was non-existent. She would say no. So there was this Svengali, as I say, relationship where he uh, did control her and the danger to him. And I think he controlled her because he wanted her to think their life was normal, their life was okay, and it was not. So uh, I don't know whether it, it was this control he had over her, or I'd say a, um, a better explanation would be that this was indeed a marriage of love. What did the Russian community, the white Russian community in Dallas, Fort Worth, what did they think of him? The, they did not like him at all uh, because uh, they uh, understood that this guy had had deserted to the Soviet Union, which they all hated, that he uh, had disgraced himself with the Marines, that he was an avowed communist. And here they were, uh, most of them displaced persons uh, coming out of the former Soviet Union. Uh, here they were, uh, super patriotic uh, Americans, uh, very, very loyal, very proud of being America, American. And for a while, they refused to meet with Lee and Marina because they did not want to be in the company of Lee. It was um, me and my father who sort of broke through this by inviting uh, the Dallas Russians to come to our house for dinner and meet Lee and Marina. But the, the quick answer to your question is they, they did not like him at all, and they were very reluctant to be in his presence. What is it that they didn't like? They didn't like the fact that he was an avowed communist, that he had, um, had deserted and renounced uh, America uh, to uh, the Communist Party, that he was an avowed communist, uh, and so on. So uh, that's what they didn't like about him. And his behavior, his personal behavior, did not um, ingratiate himself to them because he was a, sort of a pest. He um, would fly into rage when they would bring over like a baby carriage and things like that. So he was... He was an unfortunate appendage that you had to tolerate if you wanted to be around Marina, who was the real attraction. Mm -hmm. Did it make you wonder more about their time back in, in Minsk, how they got together, how that relationship evolved, and really what was going on with the two of them when they were in Russia when he defected in 59? Well, he, he defected in 59. He was sent to Minsk uh, simply to get him out of the way because Minsk was regarded as, as some out-of-the-way place where nothing happened. Uh, he clearly had in his mind the fact that he wanted to marry a Russian woman. So he spent a lot of time chasing women, and he was a fairly attractive uh, uh target for women because he had his own apartment his his salary was like double that of everyone else's why was that so, excuse me why was that that he had uh, such a good salary there uh, they, they wanted to pamper him they the soviet authorities wanted to pamper him uh, wanted him to be happy uh, they even assigned him um friends the one, his best friend, Pavel, uh, was the son of a general and was clearly assigned to Lee to make him happy. So he and Pavel would uh, chase women. They would go to plays together. Uh, this is probably the happiest time in Lee's life, those three years. Uh, and... Um, he made a big mistake, in my opinion, by by leaving Mintz, because he would not have it better than, than that. 
How did Marina wind up there? Uh, I don't really know. She was uh, born in Leningrad. I guess I, I think it was because once you graduate in a particular specialty, uh, you are assigned the first job. And uh, I'm sure the way it worked was she, her first job was being assigned to Minsk, which was not a particularly attractive uh, job offer because it's sleepy and per- provincial, etc. Was there a sense that their meeting was by accident or on purpose, that, that somehow there were forces in play that, that brought them together? I, I do not see anything sinister. Uh, they met at a dance, at a trade union dance. She was there with, with another fellow, and she had on her red dress, which, which made her into a very striking figure. Uh, she had admirers. Uh, Lee uh, spoke to her, and uh, I believe they agreed to meet. And once she learned that he had his own apartment and seemed to have plenty of money to spend, uh, she was looking for a husband. He was looking for a wife. So that's what explains how they they got together. But I see nothing sinister about it happening. Well, not necessarily sinister, but but perhaps arranged somehow. Uh, no signs of that. Lee was uh, quite uh, aggressive in his search for uh women. He uh, had a long-standing girlfriend who refused his offer of marriage, so he got together with Marina on the rebound. Talk a little bit about his decision and their decision to come back to the U.S. Lee, um, I guess two years into his stay in the Soviet Union, had decided that his, his vision of the Soviet Union was wrong, that this was not a true Marxist state. This was not a government, a regime that is following uh, the, the pattern that you're supposed to follow if you're a communist regime. Uh, the um, Minsk authorities at his factory did not value him. So uh, generally, uh, Lee was always dissatisfied wherever he was. The grass was always uh, greener. So he had learned that the grass was definitely not green in Minsk, and he wanted to get out of there. He thought that if he were to return to the U.S., it would be a different situation because he would be someone who had spent three years behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, He could speak Russian. Uh, he had written a historic diary, which he thought it could be published, and he could earn a lot of money off of that. So that explains how he decided to return. What was his argument? And, and, and were you surprised, given the history and given the fact that he defected there in 59, that two and a half years later it was easy for him to, to get the State Department to get him out? Well, we have a lot of documentation on that, and uh, this is the subject of of conspiracy uh, theories. Um, we have the extensive paperwork, all the forms he filled out, the letters he wrote, her visit to the um, uh, Moscow U.S. Embassy, which impressed her a great deal, and she she was most impressed by the cleanliness of the toilets, something she had not experienced in in the the Soviet Union. So I couldn't really see anything, to use the word again, sinister in this. It was a difficult uh, procedure to go through. And Lee, who was dyslexic and could not spell uh, properly, uh, had to take like 10 blank forms in order to fill out one blank form correctly. So you can imagine that this was not easy for him as well, given his dyslexia and uh, spelling problems. How did Marina feel about going to the U.S.? That's a very interesting question, because uh, it surprised me that uh, she agreed to it. Uh, One reason, I'm sure she was ambivalent, but uh, their child was born. Lee was definitely leaving 
So she had the choice of staying behind a single mother or going with him. But I think it also reveals the fact that uh, she was, uh, was an adventurous soul. I mean, going out with a, an American was something that her, her party cell at work um, warned her about. So the fact that she was willing to accept a marriage proposal from a foreigner uh, tells us that she she did have this adventure spirit to her. So I, I think that's a big factor. But the bigger factor was having a baby and the husband going back to America. Were there other options? Could they have left Minsk and gone somewhere else, somewhere perhaps more attractive in the Soviet Union? No, no, not at all. In fact, the, I, I was surprised to learn in in reading uh, Oswald's KGB file that that throughout his stay in Russia from his suicide attempt as an 18-year-old ex-marine to leaving the Soviet Union the the Oswald uh, case was handled by the central committee of the of the communist party and by the KGB so it's not that this was some idle decision made by some small bureaucrat. This was a decision made by the Politburo or Central Committee, which said, this guy's trouble, uh, this guy's trouble, we need to, the, in the term they use is isolation, we need to isolate him in a provincial city where he can't do harm. So he could not very well go to uh, Soviet authorities and say, well, send me to Moscow or Petersburg or Leningrad. Uh, that would not have worked, and he understood that. Talk about your first impressions, very first impressions upon meeting them, and a little bit about how that came to be, and a little bit of your, your father's history in Dallas-Fort Worth. My first meeting with Lee and Marina was in Robert Oswald's house, uh, which is in Fort Worth, not far from where we lived. Uh, this meeting came about because Lee, uh, upon arriving in Fort Worth, uh, went to the employment agency and um, filed for a job. And he mentioned that uh, among his skills was uh, fluency in Russian. I think the employment agency then recommended, well, you know, Go, go get some kind of certification that you are fluent in Russian. And my father, who uh, immigrated from Siberia in 1921, uh, volunteered to, to teach Russian at the public library. So he was a known figure if, if one wanted to find someone in Fort Worth who could speak Russian. So that sent Lee to my father's office, and he and... Uh, my father and Lee spoke um, Russian, and he had Lee read something out of a Russian periodical he had, and he gave Lee the certificate, the certificate that he, stating that he was fluent in Russian. And upon they then went out to to lunch at the Texas Hotel, which is where JFK spent his last uh, night. And upon parting, Lee said, well, I'm at uh, my brother's house. Here's the phone number. Give us a call. My father called, and he and I went uh, to meet Lee and Marina at Robert's house. And so that was our, our first meeting. And what was your first impression? Lee did not make uh, much of an impression. He uh, dressed well. Uh, and that was one of his trademarks, that he always dressed well and he would never allow himself to be seen in workers' clothes. He, he gave the impression of um, a, a strong guy, sort of wiry, muscled, although he wasn't like a, a muscle man. So uh, not much of an impression. Uh, Marina, uh, in my view, was... Uh, made much more of an impression, very quiet. She had sort of a lost kitten uh, feel about her. You sort of wanted to help her. Um, very soft-spoken. She 
like many Russians, never smiled. Uh, but I learned later that she did not smile because she had two rotten teeth and did not want to display them, which is very uh, very typical of of people who have grown up in the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the discussion was not monumental. It was um, you know, some polite conversation about their trip, what it was like to be live in Minsk. Uh, they had they brought photo albums with them, so we looked at the photo albums, and then we departed. And shortly thereafter, uh, we decided that I, as a student of Russian, should go to their house and and speak Russian with um, Marina. Uh, two, three times a week, and uh, that began uh, somewhat later and continued until I returned to the University of Oklahoma um, uh, mid to late, uh, mid-September. What did your father think of them, and what did you and your father discuss about them? My father was somewhat reluctant for me to be around Lee. I think he took him an immediate dislike of Lee. Uh, He did not like the fact that Lee was very evasive uh, because uh, he wanted to know why we Lee did what he did. And, and Lee refused to give answers to a number of of questions. And my father being um, a, an emigre, from what became the Soviet Union uh, meant that he was very patriotic American and could not really understand how anyone could, who was a Marine could even think of, of deserting uh, to the Soviet Union. So my father had a, had a real dislike for Lee and stayed clear of him. So in terms of the contact between the Gregory family and Lee and Marina, it was largely I, because my father didn't want to have anything to do with them. What kind of questions did he ask Lee that he wouldn't answer? Uh, why did you Why did you do what you did? This was the question that Lee hated the most. Uh, I read the transcript of his interrogation by the Fort Worth FBI. They asked that question as well, because it's an important question. And uh, Lee's answer was, I did it because I wanted to. So he would he could not be uh, pinned down on the answer to that very important question, why did you do it? Does it surprise you that Lee never came up with a pat answer to just make the, the subject go away, something that he would say, which may have been an absolute lie, but at least it would have dealt with the question. The fact that he never dealt with it at all is, seems somehow surprising. I, I, I agree with you on that. I believe the first time my father posed this question was in the office when he came in for the Russian language certification. And Lee came back with sort of an impudent answer. I went there and I arranged it myself, something like that. So that was his pat answer on the, when the FBI asked him that question. And it was similarly sort of an impudent answer. The the most interesting case where this came up and Lee had his back to the wall in that he had to answer was at our house uh, when we uh, had a dinner party to introduce the Dallas Russians to um, Lee and Marina. And one of the Dallas Russians, Anna Meller, uh, would not let Lee come up with his impudent and pat answer. So she kept going at him. Well, you know, why did you go? I I went because uh, capitalism is rotten. Well, that's not an explanation. Uh, You know, we know the United States. It's the land of milk and honey. How could anyone do what you did? He became very agitated at that point because, and Marina was sitting there listening to this, and it was all in Russian. So she got a a good view of of her real husband. This was a, a very tense 
moment in that evening, and it was decided by the Dallas Russians, let's let's drop it. Let's not get into this. Um, he he de- definitely did not want to give an answer to that question. Did he have to give an answer to the State Department when he applied to, to come back to the U.S.? Uh, very good question. Um, they were in, they they knew him over a period of time. He first they first met him when he was I guess eighteen and newly arrived in Moscow. He was very impudent to them, very abusive. He 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 threw his passport on the consular officer's desk. Uh, so they definitely had a very bad impression of one Lee Harvey Oswald. He then returned after the time in Minsk and um, wanting to return to the U.S. And they were very interested in trying to figure out, is this guy, has this guy really sort of converted? Does he want to go back for legitimate reasons or is he playing us? So as far as they were concerned, and in one of the letters or memos written by the consular officer who handled his case, it says something to the effect, I believe this guy has has understood that what he did was was foolish, and uh, so let's let him go back. So I think Lee was probably role-playing, but he played the role well enough to get the uh, exit visas and the surprisingly the funding in the form of a loan from the embassy to to return to the US. Did Marina wonder why he had the change of heart? And what did he tell her? Well, for a long time he didn't he didn't tell her anything. This this came as a shock to her that he was even considering uh, leaving Minsk and the, the Soviet Union. He told he he spun a tale uh, that uh, if we go to the United States, it's the land of milk and honey. Uh, we're going to live well. Uh, I'm going to be a celebrity. Uh, everything will be wonderful. Uh, everything that you dislike here will be quite will be much better in in the United States. And my, I would say the most convincing point for Marina was the fact that he said, and my brother Robert has offered that we can stay with him in his house. And so I'm sure Lee would have described the house, you know, four bedrooms or whatever they were. And so it was a sales campaign that uh, worked. Talk a little bit about the Russian community in Dallas, Fort Worth. They were a close knit group. Talk, talk a little bit about them, and 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 to what extent you know you knew them. Your father knew them. Um, certainly, the oil and gas industry was a big part of the area. Give us a sense of all of that. Well, the number of Russian speakers in Dallas Fort Worth area probably was 40 or 50 at most. Most of them were displaced persons um, who would have lived, let's say, in Ukraine or Lithuania or even Poland, for whom Russian would not be the first language. Uh, They would have arrived in the late 40s and 50s. So most of them had rather menial jobs. Uh, one of uh, my favorites, um, Theo Meller, had been a professor in in Poland, and he was a floor walker in a uh, department store in, in downtown Dallas. Uh, we met uh, periodically for parties, so there'd be an Easter, a Russian Easter, there'd be a Russian Christmas. Um, I recall... Uh, them, two or three of them coming to our house to, because they'd gone on a vacation to Haiti, and we we looked at the pictures of that trip. So it wasn't something where you met every week or so, but there were uh, these social gatherings. Uh, the 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 sort of leaders of the Fort Worth Dallas Russian community would be my father who was an established uh, petroleum engineer, you know, successful. Uh, Golly Clark, 
uh, who uh, uh, was a descendant of Russian nobility, and so she was the, the, the princess or queen of the Dallas Russian community. And then George Bucha, whose, whose father had served in the Tsar's court uh, and who was the self-appointed leader of the uh, uh, Dallas uh, Russian uh, community. Uh, he, he was a one-man social services uh, office. He took care of new, new arrivals. He arranged for them to have Russian lessons and so on. He was Lee's main protagonist when they moved to Dallas because uh, Bucha could not stand Oswald. Um, Bucha was taking over presents of things they really needed, like a baby buggy, and Oswald would uh, kick him out of the house. One time when he went over, he took a bodyguard with him for fear that uh, Lee would uh, beat him up. And Bucha was a rather frail gentleman in his uh, 50s then, I guess. So that, that was the, the, the Russian community, and they were willing to greet Marina with open arms, but then the problem was, what do you do with Lee? So Lee was this unfortunate appendage you had to deal with if you wanted to do things for Marina. Why was Marina so attractive to them all they all it seemed that they all wanted to spend time with her yourself included what was was the attraction one attraction was simply here is someone who is coming here direct from the soviet union she, she knows what it's like R remember at that point in time we knew very little this there was an iron curtain uh, there were claims that, that it was growing rapidly there were claims that it was about to fall apart so that was an, uh, was an attraction. The other attraction was, as I say, she had this lost kitten air. You, you somehow wanted to help her. You saw that she was living under rather unusual circumstances and needed help. Uh, for example, she needed to learn at least a few words of English. So you, I think there was this general feeling that um, she needed help. And she needed help, and uh, she had a husband who was preventing her from getting that help. Mm -hmm. So, and then when they moved to Dallas, the marital problems became quite evident. Uh, there was one occasion where Marina and Lee had some kind of domestic dispute, and Marina, who couldn't speak any English, somehow managed to get a cab and go to the Mellor's house where she lived for you know, a short while. So um, I think that's the best I can do to answer your, your question. You mentioned Mrs. Clark. I, I didn't catch her first name. Dolly. Who, Dolly, who was the, the sort of leader of this group. Talk a little bit about her and particularly her husband, who was, was part of the business community in Dallas-Fort Worth. Yes, um, this is Galena Clark. I think uh, her she's descended from the Sherbakov uh, family, which um, Tolstoy featured in War and Peace. So she was a real celebrity. Her mother uh, lived in Paris in some kind of palace. Her husband, Max Clark, was a prominent attorney in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, his biggest client was General Dynamics. And of course, uh, he, he and my father have been the subject of uh, rumors and speculation and so on that, uh, you know, they were involved in some kind of conspiracy. Uh, Max Clark, in particular, because of his relationship to General Dynamics and military industrial complex and so forth. So. Uh, I can't tell you how many uh, examples there are of um, accusations levied against my father and more against Max Clark. And uh, to, to go talk, ahead. no, I was talk a little bit about that in terms of of what the accusations were and 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 were any of them did any of them have a basis in any kind of fact? I mean, th there is this connection to General Dynamic. There is this lawyer who was also an attorney for, for the Warren Commission. Talk about that. 
Well, I can talk more about our family than about the answering it in general. Uh, the the I it's sort of a long story. Let's see if I can develop it. But immediately when the Kremlin learned of JFK's assassination and the fact that the suspected assassin was a communist who had lived in in the Soviet Union, they immediately and this all comes out of uh, Oswald's KGB file, which we have. Uh, there was an immediate uh, campaign to switch the blame from a leftist communist to some type of rightist organization. And they settled on the white Russian community of Dallas and Fort Worth. Later, they amended this a little bit, but originally that was their intent. So then the question is, well, how did the Dallas white Russian community pull this off? Um, namely switching blame from Oswald to someone else. The, the claim was that um, my father, who translated for Marina in the days, in the, the five days after the assassination, where uh, the FBI... Uh, Secret Service and so on, wanted to know, was there a conspiracy? And Marina would have been the best source of information about this. <clears throat> but the claim, and I believe this claim was put forward by Gus Hall, who was uh, General Secretary of the American Communist Party. The claim was that my father was deliberately mistranslating Marina to make it sound as if Lee were guilty. So that's that's the conspiracy theory relating to our family that I know the best. It never gained much traction, and you don't read about it very much, but at the time, this was the best the, the Soviet Politburo could come up with. Talk a little bit about your own personal experience. You were in Oklahoma as a student at, at the university when the assassination took place. Uh, correct. Uh, I was... At the University of uh, Oklahoma, we were assembling for class, and a fellow classmate came in and said, the president's been shot, classes are canceled. I immediately ran over to the student union where there would be, a, by the standards of those days, a, a big screen TV. There were around 50 of us sitting in front of that TV on the, on the carpet. Uh, and we heard, of course, so Cronkite telling us that JFK was dead. Uh, we kept on watching, and I think around 2.10 or so, they say they're bringing in a suspect, and uh, they brought in this, what appeared to be a fairly short fellow in a white T-shirt, bruised face, black eye, and I immediately said, that that's Lee Harvey Oswald, I know him. No one paid attention to me. They must have thought I was crazy or something. But that's how I learned about it, and that's how I learned that um, that the suspect was Lee. Uh, at first, I thought, well, they, they're bringing him in because how many uh, avowed communists are there in Dallas who had uh, lived in the Soviet Union? I thought that might be the reason. Uh, the... Uh, Secret Service came uh, to, to um, my apartment the next morning and took me into um, Oklahoma City where there was a Secret Service officer office, and th that's, that was my first interrogation. Uh, for, somehow they had uh, learned that I was, and their terminology was, a known associate of Lee Harvey Oswald. So the, the first thing they had to establish was whether I was in on it. And I think um, if you read my testimony to them, uh, by the time I had finished telling them what I knew, they wrote something to the effect is, we're, we're going to close this case. It doesn't seem like this is leading us anywhere. What about your father? Uh, they were, my mother and father were awakened the night of the assassination at, I think, 3 a.m. by two Secret Service agents 
who turned out to be the ones who really handled uh, this, the Secret Service side of the investigation. Uh, so they, they rang on the doorbell, came in. Uh, my father and mother knew exactly why they were there. Uh, they sort of struck up a relationship or a friendship at that point. Uh, by the way, the, um, the, the one who was leading this, this investigation, Mike Howard, is still alive at age, I think, 92. So he's an interesting person to, to talk to. But when they left, left they, they left the tele, their telephone number because they realized that Marina, they knew that Marina spoke no English. And so they figured if they needed a translator, maybe my father would be the one to do it. It was the next morning at 7 a.m. that Marguerite Oswald telephoned my father and told them where they were and that he should come and rescue them. Uh, she was hoping that that my my parents would open our house to her, uh, which which didn't happen. But this was sort of an interesting part of the story because um, it was my father who was able to tell the Secret Service where Marina and Marguerite were uh, hiding. Did you consider? Did your father consider taking them in? No. Why not? I guess. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think my father understood that this is not for him to decide. This is for the secrets. It was basically the Secret Service to decide. So I, th I think that's the, the explanation of, of, of why not. Uh, Marguerite continued to think that Marina and her kids were living with my father and mother for quite a while. So she would pester uh, us, um, you know, telephoning and, and trying to figure out whether we were hiding Marina and the kids. Because after the first four or five days, all relationships between Marina and Marguerite were broken and Marguerite never again saw her grandkids. Talk a little bit about your reaction to the shooting of Oswald and Jack Ruby. Uh, I was w watching uh, live TV in Oklahoma. Okay, yeah, I saw Ruby killing Oswald. It did not evoke a great emotion in me. First of all, I thought, this is a wound to the stomach. Surely he can survive that. That was my first thought. My second thought was, my second thought was, and this is when we knew that he had died, well, this is going to create a lot of trouble because there's there's going to be controversy about this. We don't have uh, all the information we need to have, so we really need Oswald alive to figure this all out. Uh, the whole while I was in, personally, I was in shock. Uh, these images on the TV screen, to me, this is something that's going on somewhere else. I have nothing to do with it. I, I sort of removed myself from even knowing that I that I knew Oswald and and so on. It was my father who told Marina that Lee had had died, and this this occurred in Irving, Texas, when they were trying to figure out what to do. This question: what to do with Marina, Marguerite, and the family, and the kids. And what is what did you, what did you know? What did the Russian community know? What did anybody know about Ruby? Nothing, zero. And to this day, how do you explain it? What do you, what do you think that was about? Insofar as I know, uh, my opinion would be no better than a, a, a person on the street. So uh, Ruby is is the one chink in my belief that Oswald did it, he did it alone, which I've held since being in that car driving from Norman to Oklahoma City to be interrogated. Mm -hmm. uh, the only chink is, how does Ruby fit into this? Uh, I'm not an expert on Ruby. I've not read all the testimony about this. Um, but I would say this this is the one chink in, in, in the armor, as I say. 
what about not knowing, which nobody really knows, what went on in Minsk in terms of how they came together and, and, and what that backstory really was? There I'm very confident uh, because we have Priscilla McMillan's account of those years. Um, we also have one of Lee's really good friends, Ernst Titovitz, who's still alive, by the way, uh, who was Lee's second best friend in Minsk. Um, we have Marina's testimony, and uh, I found Marina's testimony among the most enlightening uh, testimonies. So I think we know pretty much what we need to know about that. Now, it's interesting that Titovich does talk about the fact that they didn't get along, that, that Lee and Marina didn't get along even back then, even at the beginning. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, they were, they, were ta- they were tape recorded by the KGB. And as far as I can see, they, uh, the KGB got an earful, you know, uh, fighting, throwing things, uh, uh, physical abuse uh, in both directions. Uh, so uh, that's that's uh, in dispute. I'm not not under a dispute as far as I can see. So that's, I think we know about all we need to know about the Minsk uh, episode. Why now for you writing this book? The answer is uh, our involvement in this sordid and tragic and and terrible affair was a source of shame for our family. Uh, my father was fairly prominent in the in the community, and particularly in the oil community. There would be questions. Well, you know, what were the Gregories doing, hanging out with this uh, communist marine deserter guy? Why did the Gregories uh, invite these people to dinner at their house, and so on? Uh, so our reaction was, let's try to keep this as quiet as possible. I know my father would have objected strongly if I would written that book, The Oswalds, uh, in 1964 or 1965. So it was, it was this feeling that this is something to be ashamed of, uh, permeated. Uh, from a more technical point of view, uh, we now know a lot more than we knew. Uh, we have the Oswald KGB files. We have s- certain releases from CIA uh, and FBI. Uh, so I figured, well, I figured what I witnessed was history and it needed to be written. And that my colleagues at uh, Stanford and Hoover sort of pestered me. They said, it's history. You need to get it out, out there. I'm 81 right now. So that, that explains uh, why uh, I'm doing this 60 years after the fact. Finally, talk a little bit about how your, or, or if your attitude towards all of this and your view of all of this has, has changed in, in these 58, 59 years. I mean, it, it, it seems you've been steadfast in, in how you see this having played out. To what extent have you changed your attitudes, views of this at all in this period of time? I would say my views have not changed since my ride to uh, Oklahoma City from Norman. Uh, by that time, I'm, I would have I figured out that or I would have thought about whether Lee would be capable of organizing an assassination. The answer there is was that an emphatic no. Uh, would Lee have allowed himself to be uh, led into a conspiracy where he was a patsy, as he said um, before the cameras? The answer to that was no. Um, in the car, we were. I was listening to police reports coming in by radio, and I heard the words, they found the rifle. Yes, it's the one. And that to me told me, well, he, he, he's the one who shot the president and he's not uh, a member of a conspiracy either as an organizer or as a follower. 
he did it. Uh, case closed. I've not really changed my opinion since then, and I've read a considerable amount, including my own testimony and instances where my name comes up. So um, I would say it's rather remarkable that uh, um, you know, 59 years later, uh, I'm still that young kid, 21 years old, in, in that police car headed towards Oklahoma City. Paul Gregory, the book is The Oswalds, an untold account of Marina and Lee. Paul, I thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate being invited. Thank you.